Good afternoon, uh, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for your very kind words of welcome here. I hope I will live up to these experience, these expectations that you managed to raise so skillfully here and contribute something to this very special first lecture in the memory of uh, Colonel Brian Ward. And I must confess to you that uh, since I never met uh, Brian Ward, I've talked to a few people who, in fact, have met him to make sure that uh, um, I could represent some of that spirit. And I think um, some of the words that I've heard just in this discussion about the future strategy of ADPC, but also some of the work that all of us in our various capacities, but all with the determination and compassion uh, to reduce the impact of disaster risk represent. And here are a few words that um, uh, I think characterizes uh, Brian. One is the pioneering spirit. Um, someone who, um, like probably many of you, said that there must be a different way of doing this business. And let's see the business of responding to and absorbing the cost of disasters. Uh, persuasiveness. Some people have said maybe a streak of stubbornness, determination. Charming very experienced, but always, always knew what the end stage should be, where he wanted to get to. And isn't that something that all of us have to represent as well, a clear understanding of that these are not issues that we're just trying to puzzle together to create space. These are actually issues that have a very clear objective. Also, it's clear that there was a lot of personal conviction and care in the way Brian worked. And what I would like to link to in uh, the work that I'm going to discuss with you this afternoon is uh, he said something which we still say, but we don't always do particularly well. Um, a firm belief in national capabilities and leadership. We have very active international system and we have, I would say, hyperactive national systems. But I'm not so sure that we have yet quite well coupled them together to optimize the output of these systems as they work together. And now in Asia and in all other geographical regions, you also have a very strong regional cooperation mechanism. So I think this is really the challenge that uh, we in many ways are faced with today. How uh, to uh, ensure that this collaboration between the competencies, expertise and the resources at various levels of the system actually come together. And of course the opportunity that you've had here today is one such. So, um, what I was going to spend uh, the next um, half hour, maybe, uh, risking, is actually to discuss how we need to think about development uh, in the face of increasing disaster risk and accumulation of risk, and also the, the, the very concrete impact of climate change. And I'm doing that from a perspective that uh, we all say integrate disaster risk reduction, climate change into development, do this, do that into development. We, we bring solutions that some seem to make sense and yet we've said it for decades and we haven't yet achieved it to any degree of satisfaction. So what are the challenges we are faced with? I think in this region, uh, you have clearly experienced what probably is the main challenge, is that development and rapid economic growth in themselves generate new risks and build up an accumulation of risk uh, that is enormous. And I think this last 14 to 16 months, this region has seen many of these risks being realized. So, two earthquakes in New Zealand, the floods in, in Australia, the enormous floods in Pakistan, uh, this earthquake and tsunami in Japan that 
is going to dominate our thinking over the years to come in terms of the, the ramifications of genuine risk accumulation that countries uh, suffer. So your economic growth and the development here has been probably the strongest in the world. The aggregate GDP has grown in this region three times since 1990. That's 22 years, if at all. 17 plus 17.7 trillion dollars and the share of people that live in poverty in your region fell from 49% to 25%. So enormous achievements. And even at the height of the economic crisis a couple of years ago, this region continued to grow economically when everybody else not only slowed down to zero, but in fact also went into negative growth if there is such a thing, recession. Um, so the, the region knows how to um, use fiscal packages, effective macroeconomic uh, instruments, and the, uh, in spite of these hits to your economy in terms of disasters and the impact of climate change, the uh, continued growth is here significantly positive and you are led by, of course, the fast growth in China, but even then you have a prediction of 7% continued growth here. Uh, India in itself over 8% and China over 9% unless China decides to do it differently. Compare that with one of the fastest growing economies in Europe, which is a miserable 3%. You can see uh, that the uh, enormous opportunities, but also the enormous risks that come with this. Uh, you are also in this region on target to achieve the Millennium Development Goals, also quite unique, uh, which is three of them, in specifically gender parity and secondary education, the universal access of children to primary schools, and having the proportion of people who live below uh, the poverty, the $1.25 a day poverty line that uh, ESCAP has adopted as its standard. Um, so the threats then that we probably live on a daily by the shocks like the economic crisis and disasters clearly undermine the efforts, particularly for the more vulnerable countries, but also for the very powerful countries um, and I, I recall very strongly a visit to China in 2008 after the earthquake, which of course was the then theme of the conversation. As one of the senior officials I did meet to in fact was from the China earthquake administration, he said, yes, this is a big and costly event and tragic, but the real threat to China's economic development is climate change a drought. And if you know, uh, you must have picked it up, that I think there is an estimate by China uh, that the water shortages in China already cost China um, a 2.7% of its annual GDP because of the lack of water for productive activities. Uh, in uh, 2000, uh, last year, when uh, the UN reviewed the MDG's outcomes, the UN Secretary General report, if you remember that, it was called Keeping the Promise, took note of this, and uh, I quoted the report here, the risk of disasters is increasing globally and is highly concentrated in middle and low income countries. Reducing that risk and increasing resilience to natural hazards in different development sectors can have a multiplier effect and accelerate achievement of the Millennium Development Goals." End quote. And this is the first time, thanks to a number of very concerned member countries, we managed to get something quite affirmative into the whole NDG discussion because disaster risk reduction has not at all featured there. Some of you will remember what happened to the efforts to get it in there when the MDGs were shaped. So let's say that there is a very strong market from, from all of you there. Uh, at the same time last year, many of you contributed also ADPC and ISDR and many others. What we tried to demonstrate was how the MDGs cannot be achieved unless you risk-proof each one of them. And one of the examples, if 
I take the very s most simple one that you pick up is if we are going to get 100 million children to school as one of the goals, if the schools that are not built to standards that keep the children safe, is there any better example of a wasted effort than that? Apart from the human impact, just the economic investment. So um, the notion that poverty reduction without economic growth uh, cannot really be conceived. But how to make sure that the economic growth is both sustainable, risk-proof, and in fact also equitable, which is of course the fundamental uh, underpinning idea here. So economic growth and economic globalization is promoted by international development organizations as the main implementation strategy for achieving the MDGs. And the main tool for pursuing poverty reduction goals uh, are the well-known poverty reduction papers, uh, which already uh, has 20 years behind them helping to access resources from member states, from the IMF and the World Bank. And within the UN system, as you know, we use the UNDAF, the cooperation strategy. Now, uh, here in the ESCAP region, you have an uh, ESCAP commission that monitors and updates on tracking the progress towards achieving the MDG goals. Um, and uh, the report that the Asia Pacific region will miss the MDGs if the gaps are not filled immediately and that poverty and lack of entitlements to uh, elements of adaptive capacity will strengthen the vulnerability to disasters along the lines of age, ethnicity, class, religion and gender. So disasters in themselves are not discriminatory but they really reinforce social patterns of inequality. And if we are not consciously mitigating against that in our planning, we will, in fact, work against those very same objectives that we are trying to achieve in the eradication of poverty, uh, development goals, and also, of course, reducing disaster risk. Uh, so the experience from many countries in the world, and also, of course, here, is that through uh, norm fairly normal government planning mechanisms, you can achieve a lot in poverty reduction, but that you will definitely have, and it depends on the location and country, a residual region, a residual population of significant importance, where you cannot reduce their poverty because of the recurrent of disasters, and not the ones that you see on the front pages of the newspapers in the world, not the ones that make it to the TV headlines, but the ones that threaten people's daily livelihood, the recurrent floods, the small landslides. Uh, I remember that I, uh, as, a, as a novice on the science of landslides, I must confess, I googled landslides just to get a sense of how many people every year are killed, injured, or involved in landslides. And it was a shocking number. Every landslide may only affect 10 people, 25, a small village. But when you start adding them up, this is an enormous proportion of people. And these are as yet unrecorded losses, and uh, both of people's livelihoods, but also development investment in most countries, very few countries. If you insist on asking me, I could probably mention countries that do it, but not in the rich world, not in the middle income world, not in the poor world. Is there any systematic recording and data collection of risk? And let alone disaster data for losses. 